that have been fixed in a tangible medium and can, can be perceived by others. The reason that it's so broadly worded is I, I think the authors in 1976, the people that wrote this uh, current uh, act, we're trying to, to look ahead into the future and not have to make major amendments to the statute. So as new technology came out, you know, back in the day, I think, you know, you had eight tracks or maybe real to real recordings. But I don't you know, we're trying to anticipate that there might be future technological changes that would create original works of authorship, but that might not be specifically named or known at the time uh, that they were writing the, the uh, Copyright Act back then. Um, so it's intentionally broad, and uh, you know one of the things I was saying to the agenda before we started was, you know, in real life when you're walking down the street and you know you're on the pavement and you're looking at people's houses or walking through the business district, a certain amount of what you see is probably copyrightable or copyrighted material, but a lot of it is not. You know, you're you're just out in the world, but when you're in Second Life. Everything around you is an audiovisual work and potentially a copyrighted work, and so it's a little bit counterintuitive because you know in the normal world, you know, just because you're looking at a table or something, um, you know, that table in real life is probably not copyrighted, but here it would be, or at least it might be, uh, because it is expression or it's somebody's expression. Um, but anyway, uh, it's very broad. Um, the rights that you get as a copyright owner or an author um, is the right to exclude others from doing things, certain things, with the work. So, for example, um, if I make a, if I write a book um, and you want to make a copy of it, at least in theory, you need to have a license for me to make the copy. You have, you need potentially a license for me to display that publicly. Um, if it could be performed publicly, you might need a license for that. Um, if you wish to take a, a chapter out of my book or take the characters out of my book and write your own book, making a derivative work, again, you would usually need a license for that. And so that's really what you know the rights are generally that are given to the author or the owner um, of the original work that's protected under the Copyright Act. But there are things that are not copyright protectable, and we'll talk more a little bit more about that. But within the statute itself, your ideas, your business methods, uh, the fact that E equals MC squared, uh, you know, physical laws, those sorts of things are not protected by the Copyright Act. Now, on the other hand, if I write a book about E equals MC squared or the life of Albert Einstein, my book, of course, is within the subject matter um, of the Copyright Act. But the ideas in general uh, you know, about how physics works or the facts about Albert Einstein's life, those things are not things I could prevent others from using um, you know, in their own book or audiovisual presentation. So. Before we get into fair use, you first have to have infringement. And so what I mean by that is that I'm an author of an original work. I have a copyright in that work. And someone else has performed some kind of unauthorized copying of the protected elements of my original work of authorship. Um, and copying, you know, it doesn't have to be literal word for word. So, you know, if you were to copy the essential elements of my original work of authorship, uh, that might very well be infringement, even though you didn't take the whole book, for example, but you took maybe the key idea, um, the key concepts, key characters, uh, the storyline, um, you know, or the, depending on what the circumstances are, your infringement doesn't have to be wholesale copying of the whole thing. Um, to still be potentially copyright infringement. Um, and so you have to have this. So if, if someone's copied your work, you have to be able to demonstrate that they're infringing. And, you know, again, that has a specific legal kind of technical um, definition to it. But just because they only copy a part of it doesn't mean it's not infringement. Uh, I, I guess that's my point. There's a certain amount of facts that you have to collect in order to figure out um, you know, how this has been copied. 
So uh, this graph, I, again, I don't know if the audience can read the words here, so I'll just sort of walk through it. But um, this whole box that, with the white lines and the red and the gray and the yellow, this whole thing is represents expression. Um, the white bars on the very edges here, what I mean by that is it's expression, but it's not protected by U.S. copyright law. So, for example, um, you know, if I write down E equals MC squared, that's expression, but it's really not protectable expression uh, because that's just a basic law of physics. Um, also, you know, there are works or expressions of something that are fixed in a tangible medium, uh, but they're not original. And there's a case actually in the U.S. Uh, with regards to making exact photographs of two-dimensional art. And the photographer asserted that he had made an original work in the photograph and that someone else was copying his photographs and that that was a violation of copyright law. And what the court said in Bridgman Art Library was that, no, that slavish copying is not sufficiently original um, in order for that photograph to be protected by the Copyright Act. Um, there are also other cases. So, for example, the Supreme Court had a case about a phone book, and uh, there's a guy that made a phone book, and someone else made a copy of the phone book, and so there was an allegation of a copyright infringement. And again, the, the court said that, you know, a phone book in alphabetical order, that's just really information. You can't have uh, copyright protection for just information that since time immemorial is how phone books have been organized. Um, there needs to be some amount of originality to what you're doing. On the other hand, um, you know, another example where there is sufficient originality, if anybody's been down to Washington, D.C., to the Washington Monument, you know there are probably millions of tourists that come by on a regular basis and take photographs of the Washington Monument. And you might say, well, that's not very original because there's all these other guys that have already made a photograph of that. Um, you know, why, why should your photograph uh, be protected? How is that original? And I think that the difference is that it's you that made it on a particular day. It's a particular time of day. There's particular lighting. Um, you know, you took a few minutes to set up the shot. Maybe you had your friends in the picture. You know, so there's certain elements or aspects of that photograph that you could say are protectable. And so if someone just wholesale copied my photograph of the Washington Monument, uh, that might still be sufficiently uh, original to uh, support an infringement action uh, against that person. Not that I'm looking to sue anybody for my tourist picture of the Washington Monument. But the point is that what's protectable expression is kind of a minimum standard. And it's pretty low. Um, which is why this yellow box is so big, is that there's a lot of, of expression that's protectable under the Copyright Act. Um, now, there's this red box here, and then there's this dark gray box down at the bottom. The red box kind of cuts through the yellow box, and the reason for that is that fair use is kind of like, like a sidewalk through your piece of property where you live that lets people walk through your property and they're not trespassing. And that, I think, is really what fair use is about, is that it's the sidewalk through what otherwise would be private property. And it permits you, in certain limited circumstances, to be able to use other people's works without a license or, and really without permission. Um, you know, so we're going to talk more about the red box today. And then, the, and I'm sorry, maybe my yellow box is too light, but it's this, about three quarters of this slide here is covered by that box, um, is the protectable expression. And then uh, just at the bottom, uh, this uh, dark gray box is what's called the public domain. And within the copyright world, the public domain are um, things that used to be protected, but now are not. And it's basically because either the work itself has aged out. Um, under our current law, you have a, uh, when you make something, you have a copyright in it um, for the lifetime of yourself, you as the author, 
plus another, another 70 years after you die. So it's a relatively long time, but it's not forever. Um, so things that I make today, if I live till 2050, would be not go into the public domain until 2120, which is still an awfully long time. It's well after I would ever think about it. But we talk about the public domain because people have been making works under the Copyright Act or prior Copyright Act for a really long time. So, you know, maps that were made in the 18th century, paintings, uh, sculptures that were made really any time before 1923 and that have been available publicly um, end up in the public domain. And so what that means is you, it's not fair use. It's just simply you don't need a license from anybody in order to use that yourself or make a derivative work from it or rework it. Um, we were, uh, Agenda and I were talking about uh, the Lewis Carroll stories and, you know, the original Lewis Carroll characters are out of copyright because they were published so long ago. Um, but uh, Disney actually has its own set of uh, Alice, in Wonder Alice in Wonderland characters. So those are still under copyright uh, because they were made after 1923. And um, so you have two different sets of characters, one that would be in the public domain because they're so old and they, you know, they're illustrated in a certain way. And then you have the Disney characters that are really a 20th century thing. Um, and so, yes, uh, uh, Angel Cares, in terms of your question, um, the purpose of that 70 years thereafter is for your estate or the beneficiaries of your estate to still be able to collect royalties for your works um, for a period of time with the thought, like, you know, they say this in the art world in particular, that when an artist dies, their artwork is usually more valuable after their death. And that's partly because then, then there's a fixed universe of works that they've made during their lifetime, and there are not going to be any new ones. So that's uh, a common problem for artists that, you know, the, their heirs don't get the benefit of the increased value of their licensing, uh, potentially for, uh, you know, royalties uh, for their copyrighted work. So I think that the U.S. copyright law has had this for a while now. It used to be it was 50 years after death, but now it's 70 that, you know, you have some time to still collect royalties into the estate uh, really for the benefit of your heir um, as the author. Uh, Yeah, and, and V, in terms of 1923, the question is, when was the work published? If it's, uh, if it's a work that was never published, then there's a different set of rules that it's a little bit more complicated than to figure out whether the work is now in the public domain or not. Because um, it used to be, back way back in the day, if you never published a work, your copyright was in perpetuity. It was forever. Uh, it, won't, it was publication that triggered the time frames um, for when your work would eventually get into the public domain. And so they changed the rule. So regardless whether you, today, whether you publish or not, your copyright only lasts for your lifetime plus 70 years after you die. But they had to do something about the unpublished works before 1923. And so the Copyright Act people, uh, the legislators decided that they would have different rules for unpublished works. So yeah, it's important to know the publication date. If if the publication date, um, yeah, maybe, so I don't get too far off track. But you, th there's a set of rules about the timing. Um, you know, the, it's important to figure that out um, in order to figure out whether it's in the public domain or not. But anyway, so so you have a copyrighted work. It's not in the public domain. It's still under copyright protection, at least under U.S. law. And someone wants to use it, but they don't want to pay a license fee. So one of the ways that you can do that is if your use is a fair use. And um, what that means is a court uh, examining a copyright infringement action um, will ask, if you raise it, they will ask, is your use that you've alleged, is it a fair use, by looking at these four uh, elements in this balancing test? Um, and they are the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount of the work that was used, and the effect on the market uh, for the work. 
So let me illustrate this with three cases. So the first one is this one called Mattel v. Forsyth. Um, Tom Forsyth, I don't know if you can see, these are Barbie dolls that he's put in an enchilada and stuck in his oven and made a photograph. And people at Mattel are the owners of the trademarks and copyright, the intellectual property around Barbie. And nonetheless, it's maybe obvious why they weren't too pleased with Tom Forsyth's work. Uh, he certainly didn't ask them for a license to do this uh, work. Um, and they got upset about it. You know, they claim that they have a copyright in kind of the look of or the sculptural work of Barbie. You know, Barbie's a really well-known uh, doll. Uh, internationally known, and um, you know they they just they didn't like what he was doing because it was, you know, cooking Barbie. It was kind of offensive to them, I guess. So they sued him, and um, they got upset, uh, you know, by all these photographs that he was selling. And in fact, he still has a website today where you can buy his prints um, as a collection. Um, but he didn't pay them anything. He didn't pay them a royalty for Barbie. Um, to use it in these photographs, and so they sued him. And so what Tom Forsyth, is, this artist, is saying is that, no, it's a fair use. And so the court evaluated, you know, what is Tom doing uh, with this stuff? Um, you know, what, what makes this a fair use? And so one of the issues is that he's a commercial photographer who's making money. And in some circuits throughout the United States, that can be the kiss of death. If you're making money and you haven't paid the copyright holder a license fee, um, which is the same case in Rogers v. Coons and also um, in Blanche v. Coons with these photographs, then uh, there are courts that say, you know, if it's commercial use, it's not fair use, um, that you're just out of luck. Um, but um, as uh, Agenda will talk a little bit more in the next part, um, what courts look at is kind of what is the use? Is it a parody or satire? Um, you know, what, what is your purpose in doing this uh, and making this art? And what Forsyth said was it was sort of a social commentary that, you know, we have these ideal, idealized Barbies that, you know, make people, particularly women, feel like they need to be a certain shape or size or dimension. It's kind of unrealistic um, because no one has a waist that's that small and, and is that slim and is that tall. You know, it's just you can't look that way in real life, um, except for the one lady recently that's tried to actually have enough plastic surgery to look like Barbie. But for the average person, um, you know, that's just simply not the case. And so the court said, okay, well, even if it is a commercial use, you know, Barbie is something that is so well known and, uh, you know, is in, has been in the public eye for so long that it's sort of Barbie has entered into a public discourse about a social issue, uh, you know, about this kind of how does, how do women look or, or the idea of beauty or concept of beauty. And, you know, the court said, well, wait a minute, you know, Tom Forsythe's got a legitimate issue here that he's making social commentary about. So that particular use in that first element, you know, we're not going to just kick him out of court right away because he's making money on this. You know, he's an artist. Um, yeah, and I guess the other part of, of what you learn from the Forsyth case is that there is no way in the world that Mattel would ever have agreed to permit Tom Forsyth to make these pieces of art. They were so upset about this that this was like defamation of a really um, you know, important thing. You know, it's a product line for them. They make large sums of money every year, and this is really distasteful. Um, but the consequence of that is that if you couldn't get a license, um, from the copyright holder, that that changes the calculation a little bit from the court's point of view. So if you took anything else, if you took nothing else away from this case, you would say, you know, social commentary, Tom Forsyth has a First Amendment free expression right balanced against Mattel's property interest. And in this circumstance, even though Tom Forsyth's use is commercial, he's still permitted to do this under the fair use doctrine because... It, there's a value to the public in being able to see this kind of art um, and for this to be available to the world 
And, you know, artists can't make the stuff if they can't make any money. You know, there's a practical reality. You've got to be able to make a living. Um, you know, so that's what that's about, um, Forsyth case. Now, the next two cases, um, and I'll sort of breeze through these, both involve the same defendant, this guy named Jeff Coons. He's an artist, uh, a rather provocative artist, I think. He actually graduated from Maryland Institute College of Art back, I think, in the 60s or 70s, um, and is a well-known artist today. His works generally sell upwards of one hundred to two hundred thousand dollars per piece, um, and he's made a lot of money doing what he does. The other thing that's similar about these two cases is that the plaintiff, um, Rogers and Blanche, were both photographers, and they're professional photographers. They make a living making photographs. Um, Art Rogers uh, made this particular photograph on the left in the slide, um, which is these two lady, uh, this husband and wife and their eight puppies and sitting on a park bench, probably out in their neighborhood somewhere. Um, so Art Rogers made this photograph. And, you know, he's a photographer, so he licenses his work um, to catalogs. And today it would be Getty Images or places like that that have stock photography. But back in the 80s when Rogers made this photograph, you know, he had, he had stock photography. He would license stock photography. One of the things that he did was he licensed this photograph to um, a museum that made uh, postcards. And you could get these postcards, of Rogers photographs, really anywhere. Um, and so Jeff Koons ran into this uh, postcard one day, and he took it, and he said, you know, my artwork is about banality and just sort of the humdrum of wor the world. And this is a really banal photograph. It's just these, this couple and their puppies. You know, how, how, you know, kind of boring can this be? So I'm going to make a sculpture or not personally. I'm going to hire a bunch of artisans to make a sculpture for me based on my direction. And that's what you get here over on the right. So Art Rogers sells his photographs for maybe fifty, hundred dollars you know, not big money. Um, Jeff Koons is uh, painting or sculptures. There's actually a whole series of them that are based on similar themes of just sort of banal stuff, uh, sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. He had a show. He sold this work, made a bunch of money. And Art Rogers, I think reasonably, was upset about it because where's my license fee? Um, so he sued him. And Jeff Kuhn said, well, it's a fair use. You know, I'm an artist. Just because I'm making money, you know, I'm an artist. I, I'm making social commentary. And, you know, that my social commentary is, you know, look how kind of banal we are as a society. And, and on and on and on it went. And interestingly, the court didn't agree with him in 1992 and held that this is not fair use, that he needs to pay Art Rogers a license fee for his photograph. Same story. Later on, uh, there's, a, there's a painting that's made by Jeff Koons, and there's this photograph by a lady named Blanche, who's a professional photographer. She uh, makes photographs. This in particular was in a, an advertisement. I forget what the advertisement was about. Um, it's a lady's shoes, but there's a larger section of this that actually was a part of the advertisement. I think it was for, for perfume or guy's cologne or something like that. Um, but, you know, it's a commercial photographer, and, you know, she obviously gets paid to make these photographs. And Jeff Kuhn sees this in a, in a magazine somewhere, and he says, you know what, I'm going to make a painting about ladies' feet. And so I don't know if you can tell, but the second set of feet over here that's kind of turned the opposite way from this one is actually Blanche's photograph that was kind of cut out um, you know, from her original advertisement and put into here. So now I would think after this last case, if Coons had said, it's fair use, my painting, using this photograph without a license, that most people would have assumed that, no, Jeff, you're wrong. You're going to have to pay this lady a bunch of money. But this case came out the other way, and you get an interesting rule out of the court uh, which Agenda talks about a little later, but it has to do with transformation, which is, did you take the original and make it into something very different? And yeah, the, the, the photograph itself is, it's an original expression, 
in a tangible medium that could be perceived by others, it would fit within the rubric of what a copyright is. Um, you know, so that photograph, the ad itself, the copy in the ad, all that stuff is really under someone's copyright. Someone is the author and owns that. Um, so the bottom line is, yeah. And certainly the photograph underneath would be considered copyrightable. It's sufficiently original. Um, but this case comes out differently. And I think, Starlight, this really gets to your question which is that how can you have essentially the same basic facts but have two different results? One where Jeff Kuhn says the same thing before and after and loses, and how does he win this case? Um, the court talks a lot about his transformation. And so I guess if you compare back here, um, the String of puppy sculpture is designed, it was intended to be almost identical to what the two-dimensional photograph was. And so you know, look at that and you say, well, there's really no transformation. Just moving from one medium to another medium is not transformative. But when you take the photograph, you colorize it, you flip around the feet, you, know, you edit them in. I think he put a heel on here that was missing from this one shoe. You know, he did some stuff you know, and put it in the context of other feet dangling that the court was like, well, this is probably transformative. But the other thing is that um, Kuhn's intention here was to make an exact copy as a sculpture. And he tells, says to the court that that's the way that he was going to do this. That was his intention. Whereas Kuhn's spends a lot of time saying, no, no, in this painting that I made with, with Blanche's photograph, I used other people's photographs too. You know, I spent time on my computer and I changed this around and I did all this other stuff in the background. I was trying to say something different than what Blanche's photograph and this advertisement were really about. And, you know, so that's a key element, I think, that distinguishes these cases. But for the average layperson on the outside, I think it's still really difficult to know, um, you know, how, which one of these is really transformative. Because clearly, just being an artist with a social commentary, that's really not enough. Um, you know, there's more to it. Um, so anyway, I'm going to step off the podium and uh, turn the show over to Agenda for the rest of this. And again, we'll be happy to talk to you further. Um, if you have any other questions, I'm going to sit over here in the jury box. Thank you for mentioning that one, Angel. I will be talking extensively about that case. So um, thank you, Tim. That was a great presentation. And thank you, everybody who showed up. This is, uh, this is a really cool area of law. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Agenda. And hi. Um, <laughs> OK, um, I hope you guys can hear me while I'm looking at my notes. Can you hear me? Okay, I assume you can hear me. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about uh, copyright in general. Um, and Tim talked about this. <laughs> That's me. Um, okay, so Tim talked about this a little bit. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more because it's important to understand um, what copyright actually is. Because if you don't understand what the hell copyright actually is, then you don't understand what fair use is. Because you don't understand um, what that balance gives you. Um, so Tim talked about this some. The Copyright Act reserves several exclusive rights. And this is what we think of as copyright to the owner of a copyright work. And these rights are the right to make copies, the right to alter a work also known as the, to make der derivative works, the right to distribute a work, the right to publicly display or perform a work. OK, so these are your exclusive rights. These exclusive rights are limited in certain important ways. So your primary limitations and exceptions to the exclusive rights is the doctrine of fair use. So fair use, oops, next slide. Aha. 
Fair use is an, ex is an essential balancing element to the no monopoly protection granted by the exclusive rights of copyright. Um, from the in infancy of copyright protection, some opportunity for fair use of copyrighted materials has been thought necessary to fulfill copyright's very purpose, which is to promote the progress of science and useful arts. And that comes from the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court has always recognized that fair use is important and necessary to copyright. So copy, the, the fair use doctrine fulfills the purpose of copyright by allowing creators to borrow from the wealth of literature, art, music, film, other creative content that creates our cultural foundations rather than requiring every author to invent new expression whole cloth. Um, in this way, fair use helps move the gears of the entire creative machine by encouraging and allowing the development of new ideas that build on earlier ones. Um, thus providing a necessary counterbalance to copyright's goal of protecting creators' work product. It is this part of copyright law that keeps the rest of copyright law from grinding to a halt. Got it? Okay. All right. So let's look at the four fair use factors. And Tim went over this a little bit. We're going to go over it a little bit more. So first off, we need to understand that fair use is a defense to copyright infringement. It's not just a um, do not pass go, you are automatically allowed. It's a defense. So it grants a limited privilege for those other than the copyright owner to use the copyright material in a reasonable manner without the owner's consent. First thing a court considers is the purpose and character of the use, including whether the use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. In short, Courts look to see whether the use has merely supplanted the original or whether it has in some way transformed the original into an entirely new work. The more transformative the new work, the less significant the other factors will be. I'm going to talk about transformative use in a minute, but that's important. So when we talk about whether it's commercial or not, you also have to look at whether it's transformative or not, and you also have to look at the other factors. Again, I'm going to come back to this. There will be a pop quiz. Courts also consider the nature of the copyrighted work. So courts recognize that there are some works that are more deserving of strong copyright protection than others. So more accurately, courts recognize a greater need to disseminate some kind of works, such as news. For instance, a bare factual compilation is not as deserving of strong copyright protection as a purely creative work. A news broadcast is not as deserving as a motion picture. Courts still do protect those less deserving works. They just have a greater bur burden of proving that they need the court's protection. OK, um, so third. Courts compare the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyright work as a whole. So here, courts are looking at um, what was used compared with the original, and they ask whether the use was more than necessary. Sometimes it may be necessary to use the entire work. Sometimes it may be necessary to use a teeny tiny portion. I'm going to talk about this more because, again, it's important. And then finally, Courts consider the effect of the use on the potential market for or the value of the copyrighted work. Courts consider not only the particular use in question, but whether all such uses, if they were widespread or unrestricted, would have an adverse impact on the market for the original or on der derivative works. I'm going to give you some good examples, I promise. Next. We're going to talk about misconceptions about fair use, because there are a lot of them. And the reason that there are a lot of them is because fair use is hard. Fair use is one of the hardest areas of copyright law, and copyright law is hard. So believe me, I understand it's confusing stuff. So first, people may assume that, oh, well, this is obviously fair use. I mean, this example right here, obviously fair use. There is no such thing as a definite case of fair use. 
Fair use is always determined on a case-by-case -case basis. There is no bright line that separates fair use from, from infringement. Because there is no bright line, what one person thinks is fair may not, may not be fair to another person. If the person claiming fair use and the person owning the original work do not agree on whether the use is fair, the only person who can decide is a judge. They're expensive. Second misconception. If I change it, it's fair use. Okay? Many people assume that if they make changes to a work, the result is fair use. It's not necessarily true. So now we're going to talk about the differences between derivative works and fair use. This is really hard. Okay? So usually changes only create a derivative work. And the right to create derivative works, as I talked about, is one of the exclusive rights a copyright holder has. So, for instance, when J.K. Rowling wrote the Harry Potter books, she was the only one who had the right to make those books into movies, even though movies are different from books. So in a Second Life context, the creator of a mesh shirt is the only one who gets to sell that shirt with different textures or different sizes. All right? That's a derivative work. <clears throat> mm. Oh, did I do that? Aha! I went too far. Okay. So what about transformative use? In that fair use? So some people assume that if a work is transformative, it automatically qualifies for fair use. So we got to talk about what transformative use actually is. So courts ask whether the use has transformed the original into a new work. And in many cases, that question is significant because if the, transform if the transformation is thorough enough, the goal of copyright is furthered without the market for the original being in impacted. All right. So we talked about, uh, Tim talked about Blanche V. Coons, and Blanche V. Coons was the one with the feet, all right? So the difference between the one with the feet and the one with the puppies is maybe it's because um, if somebody wanted an artwork of two people holding puppies, they could either buy the black and white one with two people holding the puppies, or they could buy the color one of two people holding the puppies, and they're basically the same thing. There's not enough difference that if somebody wanted one, they wouldn't just go get the other. It impacts the market for the original. It doesn't change it enough. The one with the feet, if you wanted a picture of that particular foot, you wouldn't go out and buy the one with four different feet where the feet are then turned around and they're completely different and and he's just doing something completely different with them. I, you know, this is what the court determined. It's changed enough that if you if you were selling those shoes and you wanted to to buy, you know, um, that that ad for your shoes, you wouldn't have bought Coons's painting with all of the shoes because that doesn't accomplish your per your purpose. It's transformed enough. I think really what happened was that Coons told a better story to the judge in Blanche v. Coons. He explained better that. Now my work is a social commentary. And that's wor worthwhile, too. Um, I will absolutely talk about that when we're done. I will answer questions when we're done. And Starlight, you've asked a bunch of good questions. We'll get back to them, I promise. Um, so, um, it's extremely hard to determine whether a use is transformative or whether it is just derivative. Only a judge can make the decision, 
and those Coons cases are great examples. Um, another case recently that is similar to the Coons cases is Carriou versus Prince, where Carriou had taken some um, really beautiful black and white pictures of Rastafarians and published them, and an appropriation artist, Prince, uh, Richard Prince, um, cut the pictures out of his book and then made collages out of them and sold the collages for, uh, I mean, he ended up selling his collages for $2.5 million. And, um, I mean, all he really did was paste the Kiryu photos into collages. And the judge said that was not fair use. Interestingly, yes, that would be a derivative work, is what the judge said. I agree with you. Um, so... Another thing that Richard Prince has recently done, um, and this has, has gone to court, but has, there's not been a decision yet. Um, last year, Richard Prince released a work called Catcher in the Rye. It is a sculpture made of paper, glue, and ink. The front cover says, a novel by Richard Prince. And on the inside dust cover, it claims Richard Prince as the author. The price is $62. Otherwise, it is an exact replica of J.D. Salinger's novel in that it's, you can read the story. It's word for word the exact, an exact replica of the novel. Fair use or derivative work? Yeah, probably derivative work. Um, yeah, we will... The, I, I would love to hear, um, Susie, I would love to hear that. Um, we'll come back to, because this is a, a really hot area. Um, next, if I use something on the internet. Oh, the Campbell soup can. Good question. Um, okay, all right. I, I promise questions afterwards, but we will come back. Um, okay. So, if I use something on the internet, it's fair use. The internet, ooh, I have to take a drink, drink of water, one second. Ah, excuse me. Okay, the internet is a rich source of material and inspiration. However, the vast majority of material on the internet is protected by copyright. The content on the internet that is not protected by copyright, such as material in the public domain, um, uh, I'm sorry, there, there is content on the material that is not protected by copyright. However, just because something is widely accessible to the public, that does not mean it's in the public domain. Now let's talk about the public domain. Tim mentioned the public domain and had a great slide about it. I loved the, uh, the sidewalk through your property. Um, that's a great um, example. Um, Tim talked about um, Alice in Wonderland. And the example that I wanted to give is that recently in Second Life, Kokoro Lemon, who runs Coco, has just put out five Alice in Wonderland mesh avatars. They're beautiful. Um, I highly recommend that you uh, go look at them if you get a chance. Um, now, the, um, oh yes, I'm sorry. Were they Wizard of Oz? I thought they were Alice in Wonderland. Oh, you're right, they are Wizard of Oz. They're Wizard of Oz. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> yes, they are Wizard of Oz. Um, I don't know why I thought they were Alice in Wonderland, because you're right, they are They're the Tin Man, and yes. Yes, but Baum didn't do the illustrations. Um, it's the illustrations that matter. Um, in fact, Wizard of Oz is, is an even better example because there was just a case recently about how, um, how MGM still owns the movie images from the Wizard of Oz movie. And making um, mesh avatars from the Wizard of Oz movie would be infringement. 
she didn't make um, mesh avatars from the Wizard of Oz movie. She made mesh avatars from the Wizard of Oz books. The books are in the public domain. So those illustrations were in the public domain. And so her um, mesh avatars are perfectly legal and, um, and a great example of using something that's in the public domain to uh, be creative and, and very nice. Um, great avatars. Um, I can't believe I was going off about uh, Alice in Wonderland. But yeah, they are um, absolutely uh, Wizard of Oz and, and beautiful avatars. Um, anyway. Next. Okay, so percentage of use. If I use something that's a less than a certain percentage of the original, it's fair use. Nope. There is no exact amount or exact percent percentage of the original that you can or cannot use fairly. The distinction between what is fair use and what is infringement is not always clear or easily defined. There is no specific number of words, lines, or notes that may be safely taken without permission. Courts repeatedly stress that reproduction of an entire work may still justify a finding of fair use. On the other hand, reproduction of only a few words out of an entire novel may not be fair use if those words are the heart of the work. So in short, it's, it's a guessing game how much you can use and how much you can't use. It's, it's tough. Commercial use. I'm not making money of it, off of it. It's fair use. Nope. Whether the use is for a commercial purpose is one factor out of four. And it isn't the most important factor. Tim talked about that in the Mattel case. The most important factor is the effect of your use on the market for the original. In a Second Life context, for instance, if a new store opened up giving away free, full perm versions of all of Truth's hair, that wouldn't be a fair use, even if the new store wasn't making money. If I credit the original author, it's fair use. Mm -mm. If you credit the original author, author, well, you didn't plagiarize, but still not necessarily fair use. It's the use itself that determines whether or not the use is fair, not whether or not the original use was, uh, original work was credited. Next. All right. I'm doing criticism, so it's fair use. Maybe, maybe not. There are certain categories of use, and they are enumerated in the, co in the Copyright Act, that are more likely to be found fair, such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. And that's why Tim was able to use those Coons pictures. We're teaching. However, criticism can take many forms, including parody and satire. Parody is more likely to be found fair use than satire because a parody is a work that ridicules another well-known work by imitating it in a comic way. By its nature, parody needs to mimic the original to make its point, but satire, which uses irony or wit to mock human vices, does not need to borrow from protected works to make its point. All right, so I understand all of the above. I get it, I understand fair use. Fair use is easy, got it. So these rules apply all over the world, right? No. These rules apply in the United States. If you're in a country other than the United States or you want to w use a work first published in a country other than the United States, you need to look at and understand that country's copyright laws. You're on your own. All right, so let's talk about the Internet. The Internet poses really interesting copyright challenges. Especially, as Tim said, Second Life, where everything around you is copyrighted or copyrightable. Maybe it's not. Maybe we're talking about stuff in the public domain. Maybe you don't. So, <laughs> excuse me. The internet functions through copying. Merely viewing a website creates a copy in the local computer's RAM, 
and fortunately the law has adapted to our changing technological needs. Viewing websites and making a local copy necessary, necessary to do so is generally a fair use. But at one time, a court had to ask and answer that question. Other basic web functionality and be behavior that we have grown accustomed to was once hotly litigated. Thumbnail images in search engines are fair use, but only after extensive litigation said so. Displaying cached websites and images in search results is common behavior now, but only after a court held it fair use. On the other hand, certain other technologies have been found to be infringing and not fair use. And these technologies are no longer part of regular internet use. For instance, a court held that reproducing the entire text of numerous news articles originally posted on newspaper sites was not fair use. Downloading songs using peer-to-peer -peer software, even if it is to evaluate whether or not to purchase those songs, is not fair use. And nobody does that anymore, right? Nobody ever does that. And streaming movie trailers to consumers without permission is not fair use. Okay, now let's talk about the Lentz case. Because as uh, one angel mentioned, there is, uh, there is recent action on the Lentz case. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So, Lentz versus Universal has recently held that uh, under the DMCA, a copyright holder must consider likely claims of fair use prior to requesting a DMCA takedown notice. Stephanie Lentz posted a video on YouTube of her baby dancing around the kitchen to Let's Go Crazy by Prince. Universal Music requested a takedown notice and Lentz sued, posting that the DMCA, or pointing out that the DMCA requires that Universal have a good faith belief that they were entitled to a takedown. And since they did not consider fair use, they could not meet the good faith belief standard. The court agreed. <laughs> now, the thing with, um, the uh, Lentz case is that we don't have any new, um, any new and exciting fair use holdings. We haven't found any new data on whether or not the use of Let's Go Crazy was or was not fair use. But they, the threshold for considering fair use in a DMCA takedown is kind of a big deal. We're using streaming music on here. Um, courts have considered streaming video in fair use. I mentioned that earlier, streaming movie trailers. said so that right here. Um, Courts have considered streaming video in fair use and found that streaming video without permission was not fair use. Um, broadcasting streaming music over the internet, webcasting, has been regulated by the Library of Congress directly. Webcasters may broadcast music for a small fee per performance. So if you're just webcasting um, without paying that small fee to ASCAP, BMI, whatever, you're infringing. Okay. So anyway, that's it. Um, I am done. Tim, if you want to come up here and join me and we can answer some questions because I know that there were a lot. Sure. Well, I, oh, I, I did want to... Under an hour. I did want to say about the Campbell soup cans. I was looking while... Um, to your question, um, I guess I could talk generally about the difference between patents and copyright. Uh, patents deal with inventions where copyright protects um, 
original works of authorship are tangibly expressed um, in a, a, a mode that other people can perceive. So in general, a patent covers, if I come up with a new kind of paperclip, um, the way that the paperclip works is the invention, whatever that new might be, because obviously paperclips have been around a long time. But if I have a newfangled paperclip, um, that's what the, the patent law is designed to cover. Um, when you're dealing with um, ideas, so if you have an idea that you write a book about and you want to protect the idea, generally you don't want to have a copyright because the idea is not protected by the copyright. Copyright law doesn't help you with that. Um, if you have an idea about an invention, generally in, Mer in the U.S. you have to uh, work on filing for a patent and you have to get through the minimums that the patent law sets for inventions to be protected. You get a shorter time frame for the protection. And um, again, it's exclusive and it also excludes uh, through the doctrine of equivalence other inventions that might be similar. So it's a very different kind of protection than copyright, uh, which is really just about the tangible expression um, of ideas and, uh, and concepts. Um, the very different things. And I think in the interim, um, usually what people do with, in, with ideas that are for an invention is they try and protect them under trade secret law. Um, and so you have to keep them confidential and release them only to other people that have agreed to keep them protected um, until you can get to the point of filing a patent. But um, they really protect two different things. In uh, the class I taught last semester, there's a concept called design patents which are the ornamental part of things that, uh, like a piece of furniture might have a design in the headboard or um, the feet might look a certain way for a table. Um, and those can be protected by a design patent. It's a little bit different than what copyright would protect um, with regards to the ornamental appearance of furniture. Uh, but there is some overlap um, between those two concepts in the law. Uh, but I guess generally speaking, um, you know, your idea is if you have a copyright and I decide to, in, to deal with it as an invention, um, they're really two different things. And it's potential that, um, you know, you could have someone come up with an invention based on ideas that you've written in a book. I mean, you think about all the science fiction writers that have written about things that now actually have become a reality. The people that have made those inventions have a different set of protections um, than the original science fiction writers did as to the just basic concepts of, of warp drive or teleportation or you know other things like that. Other questions from the crowd? I hope I answered your question, Starlight. I'm scrolling back some to try to see which ones we missed. Porn falls under copyright. Porn is absolutely copyrighted. Yeah, I guess, uh, V, you know, that is really, um, it's a question of whether it's, it fits within the broad definition of original expression that's fixed in a tangible medium. Uh, and so lots and lots and lots of things fall under that general definition and are protectable under a copyright act. Even things that are offensive, even things that are banal, uh, even things that are boring, uh, you know, all that potentially can fall under, uh, you know, copyright protection. Um, and I guess uh, I was just reading through, Susie, your, your questions here. Um, we might not be able to really answer specifically 
you know, we, it, I would be remiss if I gave you legal advice here in public. Um, if you, you know, if you have more general questions about a, a, a hypothetical fact pattern, certainly we can talk to you about that um, separately. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, you know, I, I think that there's lots of complicated situations that come up, and I think yours is probably one of them, that um, stuff happens, people get confused. Um, and, you know, even if you're a lawyer, sometimes it's not clear or, or you're not clear with other people or they aren't clear with their intentions with you. I mean, there's a lot that leads to litigation because of a misunderstanding um, sometimes it's because it, people believe in the myths, some that agenda has debunked today. Other times it's just that we weren't clear about what our intentions were and who the author was uh, and what, you know, what was permitted, what wasn't, what required royalty, what didn't. You know, it, 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 it's a big, complicated world. Um, it's often why people end up in my office. <laughs> um, in terms of mashups, um, I you know, again, it really depends on whether the mashup was uh, reached the transformative um, level. Um, I think often they don't, often they're derivative, but sometimes they're um, they're transformative. Um, it it really depends. I think it's um, one of those things that you can make a case on. Um, where you can say, you know, look, uh, this um, this wouldn't affect the market for the re for the original work, or by making this mashup, I am actually making a commentary on the original work. I am making a parody of the original work. The um, the original parody case is actually I don't know if anybody here is old enough to remember two live crews, uh, me so horny. Um, and uh, it's certainly not a masterpiece of rap, but that's th that's the foundational case for parody and fair use. Um, probably actually the foundational case for fair use altogether. Um, it's the one that, that really defines the four factors and the Supreme, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court goes through the four factors. And um, what happened was a, this was in the uh, 80s, um, and a rap group, Two Live Crew, had sampled Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman. And, um, oh wait, no. Um, yes. Anyway, um, they had sampled Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman. And, um, uh, and used um, the hook and the first um, the first verse from Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman, and um, and Roy or the um, A Cuff Rose Music, who owned the song, said that was infringement, and um, Luther Campbell also known as Luke Skywalker, um, said, no, it's, it's fair use. And um, the Supreme Court agreed because what he was doing was parodying the earnest, um, heartfelt Roy Orbison, Orbison song and making it raunchy. So you have a case with mashups if you can make the argument good enough. And uh, Susie, I, I probably shouldn't have responded before you finished uh, texting. Um, I, I think that what you've illustrated to the group is that even with all of our theoretical understanding of the law, that people sometimes just ignore it and you end up in court uh, to enforce your rights. And um, that also is unfortunate, particularly when you have a written licensing agreement or an understanding and people say, nah, I can do what I want. Um, you know, you, you have that too, that people do um, just decide that they're going to do their own thing and they really don't care, you know, come chase me um, is kind of the attitude. And I, I think that's a shame. 
And I think there's kind of, you know, there's a lot. I was actually at a seminar. Um, yeah, it can be very hard in SL when you're dealing with people in other countries or, you know, they're just judgment proof or just don't care. I mean, it's a lot of practical considerations to copyright law that, you know, not every case is a good case or one that you can afford to pursue or that's worth the trouble of getting a judgment. Um, in terms you know. of first publication, at least under U.S. law, if something is first created in Second Life, its country of first publication is the United States. No, it it's uh, it would have to be according to where the work was first published, and if you first created it in Second Life, um, it's here. It's in it's in the United States. Yeah, I know people argue about the forum's law, and there is a choice of law, conflict of law question uh, that can get a little bit more complicated about which country's copyright law actually applies. Um, you know, so and I know people argue, well, I made it in Norway or Sweden or something, so therefore it should be that country's law that that governs. Um, but you know, it also depends on what forum you pick to sue, and you know how their choice of law uh, laws actually work. That's I think you could teach a law class just on that question um, about uh, you know conflict of laws and choice of law. Starlight, uh, one thing you can do, the Creative Commons exists, and there's a lot of people that are original authors that um, create works and dedicate them to the public domain and or uh, license them under a Creative Commons licensing scheme. Um, you know, in some ways, the, the big companies have benefited from the Copyright Act as it's written uh, because they're the owners of massive amounts of intellectual property that they want to exploit. They have the resources to exploit. And they really have no reason to want to give anyone else any rights uh, because they want the benefit for themselves. Um, yeah, and so the lack of clarity in some ways may be good for them because they can threaten to sue you. Um, and that scares a lot of people from doing anything, um, you know, which is unfortunate. It sort of reduces the competition. You have to be a brave person or a brave soul to be an artist, I think, uh, because there's fair amount of risk with some of this stuff. Um, and as you can tell from the fair use discussion, it's not clear when it's fair use and when it isn't. It just depends, which is a crappy answer for a practicing artist, but it's a real answer from a lawyer <laughs> because it's the truth. We just, it's not clear. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, if you're making a video in Second Life, you know, and if you think about a lot of the things that are made here in, in our Second Life bar office are really uh, agendas work. She's the author. Um, you know, what would you do? Um, how would you even go about getting permission? You know, in the real world, um, when you're making a movie, there's sort of a limited subset of people you have to ask permission from and, uh, you know, to get the right to use people's likenesses individually, um, you know, and you have a certain amount of trademarks that are out there that might be publicly displayed and, and other things. But Second Life is a different matter, and I really don't know a good answer. Um, you know, I can't say that it's just clearly fair use because everything here is created by somebody, um, whether it's the... Uh, you know, the, the individual images that make up the textures or it's the characters or, you know, the, the, the avatars, the clothing, um, you know, landscape, all that stuff is really authored by someone. 
Uh, and I'm not really sure. I don't know, Agenda, if you have any thoughts about that uh, better than mine, um, how you go about approaching that. Sorry, I was looking up a case for Sam. The um, reference is Colonel Records, the uh, Colonel Records OI v. Mosley, um, 694F3rd1, uh, I'm sorry, 694F3rd1294. It's a 2012 case. Yeah, I, we were just talking about this video question in Second Life and the credit. I mean, I guess in theory, it's really infringement. Um, you know, that if you don't have permission from all the authors of all the uh, uh, 3D animations and or textures and graphics and in second life no it's not yeah. um second life uh terms of use makes it explicit that um you can record machinima um and you are get granting a license to people that are recording machinima yeah but absent that licensing agreement so it's governed by that contract and everybody's consenting to that absent that i think it's a theoretical infringement so the second life people realized that, I guess, early on and wrote it into their licensing agreement uh, that everyone's consenting to when they use the system, that they're consenting to you being able to make a video. Uh, um, the, uh, actually, the change to the license agreement only happened in 2008 or 9 um, because it was a problem, because people were complaining about it. Um, so, yeah, it was um, it was something that the um, that the machinima creators community um, was concerned about. Well, and the, being yes, courteous, a, sorry, go on. Being courteous goes a long way, I think, with some people. Uh, you know, most of us are pretty humble artists, so, uh, you know, it's it's different, I think. If you're picking a fight with Campbell Soup Can or um, some big company, I think you get a different outcome. But the yes, it's a U.S. case. That's why I said under U.S. law, um, you would be. Uh, that's why I said under U.S. law. I I can't speak to um, other countries' rulings, but under U.S. law, um, first publication in the U.S. is. Um, if, if you first publish publish something in the U.S., you're bound by U.S. copyright law. I... I'm just saying that if if you first publish something in the U.S., you are bound by by copy, U.S. copyright law, and you can be sued here. I think that's what you said, Agenda 694 F3D 1294. Colonel Records, OIV Mosley. Um, there's another case too, and I'm, uh, it's Shropshire versus Canning, I think. I would have to Google it, and I'm kind of in the middle of um, this. Um, but it was a case of a Canadian, um, uh, Canadian YouTube artist that um, made a YouTube video using Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. Um, I would have to Google it. Um, I really think it's Shropshire versus Canning. I can't remember. Um, but again, they were um, they were bound by U.S. law as well. Um, no, U.S. has less strict copyright law. Um, we are we don't follow the Berne Convention. Um, we sort of we wink and nod to the Berne Convention. Um, but we don't follow the burn convention. Um, burn convention countries have much stricter copyright law.
Good question. Cho uh, choreography is also copyrighted. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I uh, again, I, I don't know, but in in, in theory, hy hypothetically, um, a parody parody is um, lends itself <clears throat> excuse me lends itself to fair use. So um, probably fair use. Yeah, when you look at uh, Campbell v. A. Cuff Rose, the Supreme Court case, which is specifically about parody, one of the things that happened in that case, the, the court had to ask, you know, how much of the bass riff could you use and for it to be recognizable and be a parody? And it actually got returned back to the, I think, the trial court because there was a question, as a factual question, of whether they used too much of the bass riff. Um, you know, so even if it's a parody, if you use the whole thing, if you didn't need to use the whole thing for people to realize the parody, that might not be protected by fair use either. If it's transformative but not transformative enough, it may not be fair use. So it kind of depends. I, I think that one of the problems is that every single situation you have to think about all the facts and then look at what the applicable case law is and then come to a legal conclusion about what you're doing. And um, it's not a yes or no. You know, I always know if I'm cutting through my neighbor's yard in the middle of their yard that it's trespass, especially when they have a fence and a barking dog. That's much easier to figure out, you know, trespass, no trespass. I think fair use is a lot more gray, um, you know, and it's not easy. Um, I think that's often why us business attorneys would suggest you buy general liability insurance to cover your work because they usually have a provision to defend you from infringement actions. Um, and you may need that. You may need someone to pay your legal bill um, if someone gets mad and sues you, uh, particularly for famous works. Um, you know, they get pretty upset. And even if they're wrong, you can spend a lot of money, as the Mattel case illustrates, you can spend a lot of money on, legal, on lawyers to ultimately vindicate yourself. Um, so you want to make sure either you have the money um, or you have someone who will cover you. So, V, to answer your question, um, you would be screwed um, if you're using something from someone else with their permission, but they, the person that gave you permission isn't the copyright holder, you're screwed. Um, only the copyright holder can give you permission. So um, you would have to then go after the person who erroneously gave you permission. So, yeah, you have to make sure that you're getting permission from the actual Copyright holder. Anyone else? Yeah, insurance actually can be hard to get. I've looked at errors in emissions insurance for my technology business, and they ask you a lot of questions. You know, they want you to do the least risky things in order to provide you with insurance coverage. They don't want you to take big risks because they don't want to get sued either. Um, but it's worth at least looking into what the application is and what the cost is likely to be, um, particularly as, uh, as Angel suggested, as you get more well known. I think you take a bigger risk, um, you know, without having some kind of coverage for business opportunity like that. <laughs> I can't wait to see that one.
Okay, well, um, if there are no more questions, it's 1130, and I think we're about done. Thank you guys so much. Oh, one more. <clears throat> um, you know what? We need to... Um, you can absolutely join the group. Um, we have a we have a fee to join the group, so um, uh, we would love for you to join. Um, we need to. Oh gosh, great! Please join the group. Um, we have uh, meetings every um, the second Saturday of every month, and we would love for you to come. Please. Um, we would love for all of you to come if you're interested in law in Second Life. Um, we're an active group. We are putting on more of these uh, presentations. We've got one coming up on taxation in virtual worlds and one coming up on immigration. Um, so we'll be doing these pretty regularly. Um, yes, there is a place to tip the venue right outside. You look for the little scales. Um, and uh, and we would love for you to um, to join. And I guess Starlight, um, you know, I that, that's a hard question. Um, uh, the uh, concept of Facebook itself, I don't know if there's a patent out there. I know there's a lot of code that would be under copyright, but I suspect that you wouldn't be able to get to the object code for Facebook, or I'm sorry, the source code, uh, because they have it uh, protected uh, securely as a trade secret. Um, but it's it takes a lot of effort. You're right, you know, patents are expensive to get. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, if it's a great idea that, is a great invention, you might very well think it's worth it. Generally, the uh, patent attorneys are going to do that analysis with you. The question, is it worth the legal fees to get the patent for this? Is there a market for it? Um, and, you know, you need to answer yes before you go pay the bill. But um, I don't know. You know, I think the, the guys like Steve Wozniak back in the 80s probably didn't think much about it. They're just hanging out together, making cool stuff, and they weren't worried about the intellectual property rights. Except maybe Steve Jobs, but I think most of those guys, that wasn't a worry for them. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Hopefully, you guys will be able to join us. I think our next meeting is February 9th uh, here at the bar office, and uh, there's a schedule on our website of other presentations coming up, so we look forward to talking to you. Uh, let me give you a link to our website.